All right. So we have different stresses in soil, isn't it? You have uh, you know heard about different stresses already, not just in soil. You have already heard about different stresses like tensional stresses, compressional stresses, shear stresses, torsional stresses, combined stresses, etc. So different loading criteria or different site conditions. Uh, your soil might be subjected to different stresses like this. In your uh, 15 CBL 212 soil mechanics, the last chapter consolidation, we dealt about compressional stresses, right? Stresses were acting in the vertical direction, which causes which caused the compression of the particles in the vertical direction, and that squeezed out the water from the voids and caused the overall settlement of the soil mass. So that we saw there. Okay, that we considered only the compressional stresses, but you look at the bottom image you can see a retaining wall imagine uh, at that failure surface that is marked in that figure the the bottom right uh, figure with a retaining wall you can see a orange line and a black line there which shows a failure surface all right so above that you can see that the soil has subsided a little bit and it is sliding downwards displacing that retaining wall so here the compressional stresses that are acting acts normal to that ground surface right it's pretty obvious isn't it due to the self weight of the soil we calculated the self weight or the overburden pressure etc we calculated in the uh, effective stress principle if you remember it all right because we calculated the total stresses at a particular depth and uh, in that effective stresses we calculated pore pressure we calculated so for a particular depth if you imagine at a particular depth uh, if you want to calculate the uh, overburden stress at that particular point, what did you do? You multiplied your depth by the unit weight of the soil above that, right? So that, imagine that acting on this failure surface, right? So a load that is acting on the ground surface, it acts normally on the ground surface, which tries to compress the soil mass. But how does the soil resist it? The soil resists it by, you know, this you can see this failure surface here that is the soil is trying to slide down right so there is a resistance that needs to be developed to prevent further deformation or you know the soil has to carry that compressive load on the surface right so the soil tries to hold its position and prevent itself from sliding outwards so what happens on that sliding surface some shear resistance is mobilized, isn't it? Some shear resistance is developed so that the particles will not slide down. So you apply a compressive load here as well. You, compress a, you apply a normal load here on the ground surface, which acts as a compressive load, but the effect on the soil, the soil particles will try to interlock themselves so that they don't slide or roll over each other and cause the soil to displace, correct? So once the soil does that, for the soil to do that, they have to mobilize some shear resistance, right? So shear stresses here, as you can see in the uh, middle figure, shear stresses, you can see that two blocks are moving apart each other, just ambiguous to uh, two soil particles sliding over each other or rolling over each other. The soil tries to prevent that, okay? The soil tries to prevent that movement and in the process of preventing that movement, such stresses are developed and we call that stresses shear stresses and as you can see in the bottom image in the retaining wall image you can see that the soil mass is sliding down indicated by the purple arrow and it is sliding down along that particular surface that black line sliding surface that surface i'm going to call it as the failure surface so along that failure surface in that whole soil mass that failure surface may be a weak point Right, it may be the weakest point where the particles can slide over each other very easily. Okay, like I used to tell a, a saying, right? Uh, no chain is stronger than its weakest link, isn't it? So similarly, in this whole soil mass, however the soil uh, at different points uh, may be, if there is a weak uh, plane in that soil mass, that is the plane along which the failure is going to happen first. Right, so there might be a weak point here, or there uh, the total stresses applied might overcome the total sliding resistance of the soil along that particular plane. That means the soil has overcome the maximum uh, applied shear forces, or the shear resistance is not enough to carry the soil in that position. Then, in that condition, what happens? 
that soil slides over each other as you can see indicated by the purple arrow the soil slides down and displaces the retaining wall so along that surface along that failure surface what happens shear failure occurs right so different stresses in soil in the case of soil generally the failure is indicated in the uh, in terms of shear stresses or shear strength because that is the main uh, you know strength criteria of soil how you can define it can you can define it as the resistant to deformation by shear stresses as you can see in the bottommost figure you are trying to resist the deformation of the whole soil mass by development of some shear stresses once the shear stresses developed is higher than the maximum shear resistance that can be mobilized by the soil then what happens along that failure surface the soil deforms so when the soil is subjected to compressive stresses as i mentioned these normal stresses the particles try to roll over each other and uh, shear stresses are developed so the shear failure occurs when the induced the shear stresses induced due to this comp compressive loads exceeds the shear strength of the soil or the shear uh, resistance uh, is not enough to uh, carry the shear stresses developed in the soil due to that applied compressive loads. So what happens during the shear failure is the particles can slide or roll over each other. So shear strength of the soil, where does soil get its shear strength? Here you can see that shear strength that is development of some shear resistance what do you call as strength what do you mean by strength strength means the maximum load it can carry right above that particular or the shear, maximum shear resistance it can carry above that resistance uh, if you apply a shear stress higher than the maximum resistance then the soil will fail so the maximum shear uh, stresses the soil can resist or the maximum possible shear resistance in that soil is called the shear strength of the soil so where does soil get that shear strength? Yeah, so shear strength of the soil is derived from, as you can see in this figure, there is some irregularities between these surfaces, as you can see. So there is some interlocking of these irregularities. Imagine uh, the knuckle theory. I use my knuckles to, sh knuckles to show uh, the angular particles rolling over each other. So this is something similar to that. You can see surface one surface to imagine these as very angular soil particles. So the soil particles, when you apply some uh, shear stresses, what will happen when some shear stresses are developed? What will happen? The particles will try to interlock themselves all right, along their irregularities and they will prevent that rolling or sliding movement, isn't it? So shear strength is basically resistance to that deformation. Right. So shear strength of the soil is derived from resistance due to this interlocking between the particles. Then frictional resistance between those individual soil particles. It can be sliding friction, rolling friction or both. So one is due to interlocking. Another one is due to the frictional resistance that prevents it from sliding or rolling over each other. And the last one is cohesion or adhesion between the particles. That is cementation or electrostatic attraction. We saw for all those clay minerals, uh, you had some unbalanced electrons at the surfaces, isn't it? So there can be some electrostatic attraction between each other or which causes some cementation between different uh, clay mineral particles, right? So these soil uh, gets its shear strength due to these three phenomena. So now coming back to the basic types of soil, you have a sandy soil or granular soil and you have cohesive soil, right? So granular soil, it will derive its shear strength from the first two sources isn't it resistance due to interlocking and frictional resistance correct granular soils they don't have any surface charge or anything they are just granular soil or sandy soils are cohesion less soil you call it cohesion less soil they are just soil which is derived from weathering of rocks isn't it different types of weathering we saw right different types of deposits we saw like a strine marine uh, alluvial etc etc we saw different types of uh, soil sediment and deposits etc so those are uh, those were all weathered rocks right so those are sandy soils or cohesionless soil so they derive their shear strength from the first two sources all right what was the other type of soil other type of soil was clay soil clay soil how is it developed when uh, chemical decomposition the first one is due to physical uh, weathering or physical decomposition and the second one is due to chemical decomposition D different processes were hydroly uh, hydrolysis uh, oxidation reduction carbonation uh, colloid formation etc so that caused formation of clay soils which had a net 
negative or positive charge on the surface, isn't it? Surface and the edges. So clays derive strength from which source? Uh, first one, second one, or third one? So you can uh, see that clay soils, they are flaky in shape. They do not have much uh, size or uh, friction between each, each other to, uh, you know, resist the movement by preventing the rolling or sliding. So they derive their strength from the third source only, isn't it? Cohesion or addition between the particles because of their uh, net electrostatic attraction. So no soil is purely granular or generally. Generally, most of the natural deposits, they are not completely uh, sandy or completely clay. So most of them are, most of the natural deposits are pretty much uh, part, uh, partially granular and cohesive. So most of them are partly granular and cohesive. So they derive their strength from different sources as mentioned on the top. They have their strength due to resistance between the uh, interlocking due to particles, frictional resistance, then some cohesion. So a natural deposit can derive its strength from any of these. So now, first analysis by a Mohr circle. I'm uh, pretty uh, confident that you are already introduced to Mohr circles in your solid mechanics course. You have already seen, uh, you know, stress systems, two-dimensional stress systems, and uh, Mohr circle. Uh, how to draw a Mohr circle, etc. You have already come across in your solid mechanics course. Uh, you have a basic idea of what a Mohr circle is. It's a system of stress. It represents a system of stresses. So keeping that in mind. So imagine a soil element, as you can see, with a center O. This Imagine that this is a uh, element and there is a system of stresses acting on it. This is a plane strain problem. This is a two-dimensional representation. Actually, for an element, it is three-dimensional. I am representing it in two dimensions. Uh, so two planes. So I am calling this as a plane strain problem. So a system of uh, two-dimensional stresses, you can see. Uh, one is sigma x acting in the uh, x direction and sigma y acting in the y direction and there is some shear stresses developed due to this to prevent the coupling action or the coupling moment that causes it to rotate in the clockwise or anti-clockwise direction all right due to these compressive forces they are they try to you know rotate this element due to this normal forces they try to rotate this element and it is uh, prevented by development of this shear uh, stresses developed in it. So you can see uh, sigma y uh, normal stress acting in the y axis from the x plane. All right, from this particular plane xx, sigma y is acting in the y direction. Then tau yx, you can see it's acting uh, on the plane where sigma y acts in the x direction, tau yx. Then similarly to xy again to yx and again to xy so this is a system of stresses acting on that particular element all right using this you can construct a more circle so every plane passing through any point in a loaded soil mass it will be subjected to a normal stress and a shear stress as you can see in this figure now imagine this as a soil element imagine this as the same uh, soil element from this imagine this as a soil element from this particular uh, you know soil mass in this retaining wall backfill okay imagine it is a soil element from this so what loads are applied there so you apply due to the uh, self weight of the soil or maybe a structure on the ground surface maybe a house on the ground surface some normal compressive uh, loads are applied on the soil right and some confinement of the soil the soil element is covered by soil on its all sides isn't it so due to that confinement some other uh, stresses are also acting on the sides of the soil element and due to some uh, compressive forces or normal forces there is another system of load acting on the soil surface so you can see on all sides of the soil element there is some system of stresses acting you can see there are normal stresses sigma y sigma x sigma x sigma y and there are shear stresses which act tangential to the surface of the soil element all right so this is my system of stresses as of now okay in the actual site condition, this is a three-dimensional stress system. You will have sigma z as well, okay? And tau uh, yz, tau xz, etc. you will have, okay? It's actually a three-dimensional system. I am representing it using a two-dimensional system. So keeping this soil element in this, uh, soil element like this, out of different planes. So e any plane you consider within a soil mass, there is a system of stresses acting on it, right? So out of all those numerous planes, 
you imagine you consider three mutually perpendicular planes on which the stress is completely normal and no shear stress acts. So such planes on which the load is purely normal and there is no shear stress acts, such planes are called principal planes and normal stresses acting on these planes are called principal stress. I am very confident that you have seen this in your solid mechanics, principal stresses, principal planes. So I hope you remember this. So those planes, mutually perpendicular planes, maybe X axis, Y axis and Z axis, three mutually perpendicular planes on which the stresses are completely normal and no shear stress acts. Those planes are called principal planes and the normal stresses acting on those planes, they are called principal stresses. So the maximum magnitude in that it is called the major principal stress and the minimum is called the minor principal stress and the intermediate one is my intermediate uh, principal stress corresponding to the uh, different planes on which they act the major principal plane minor principal plane and the intermediate principal plane. So sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are the uh, principal stresses which are nothing but the normal stresses that act on the planes on which the stresses are completely normal and no shear stress acts which are the principal planes. So the principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 act on principal planes. Right. So the highest magnitude it is my sigma 1, lowest magnitude is my sigma 3. So in this figure I am going to consider my sigma 1 and sigma 3 alone. Okay. I am not considering the three dimensional one here. I am going to consider a two dimensional system here. Okay, so you can see a soil element here. On the bottom right image, you can see a soil element. On the x axis, you have the minor principal stresses sigma 3 acting. And on the major principal plane, major principal plane is your xx, right, on which your sigma 1 acts in the y direction as you can see from the figure sigma 1 acts on the xx plane so xx is your major principal plane here okay and sigma 1 is your major principal stress here then sigma 3 it acts on the yy axis which is your minor principal uh, plane on which your minor principal stress sigma 3 acts all right. So due to this stress system, sigma 1 and sigma 3 acting, the shear resistance is uh, of the soil is mobilized. Shear stresses are developed due to these uh, stresses acting on the soil element and some shear resistance is developed in the soil, soil due to uh, the shear stress. The shear stress developed here is tau. This, imagine that the soil is, uh, you know, imagine that we are considering a plane AB within that soil element. Okay, imagine a random plane AB on that soil element, which is inclined at an angle theta. You can see angle BA. Oh, there is no symbol here. Okay, uh, uh, you can see the angle theta here. So imagine any plane within that soil element inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane. Major principal plane is xx, right? So this is inclined at an angle theta. So I have a plane AB. So if you consider the plane AB, the resultants of the whole stresses acting here, all right? Or on the plane AB, let us imagine on the plane AB, there is a system of stresses. Now on that plane, the normal stress acting is sigma and along that surface, a shear stress is developed, which is represented by tau. All right. So the soil here, what it is trying to do is a normal stress is acting here, sigma, and the soil tries to keep its uh, natural state without deforming by resisting this tau. Right. It tries to resist this uh, deformation or it will generate some shear resistance to resist this shear stresses developed on that plane AB so that this plane doesn't along this plane the soil doesn't slide down or the soil deforms all right so now my system is i have sigma 1 sigma 3 then i have a plane ab which is inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane and on that particular plane ab i have another 
uh, stress is acting on that plane AB, normal stress which is acting perpendicular to it, it is my sigma and the shear stresses developed on that plane AB which is inclined at an angle theta is tau. Okay, this is my system of stresses. Look at that figure, understand that figure very clearly based on this stress system. Based on this stress system, we are going to draw the Mohr circle now. Okay, this is my stress system. Sigma 1, Sigma 3, Sigma 1, Sigma 3. Then plane AB, inclined at an angle theta. On the plane AB, I have normal stress. On the plane AB, I have shear stress. This is my system of stresses as of now. Okay, so imagine that plane AB. Consider that wedge ABC. Okay, I am considering this wedge ABC. I had a system of stresses sigma 1, sigma 3, as you can see in the figure 2, okay, figure B. I have sigma 1, I have sigma 3 and on the plane AB, I have my sigma, which is my normal stress on plane AB. Then I have my shear stress on the plane AB top. The resultant between that normal stress and shear stress, I have a resultant marked here and that beta is my angle of obliquity. All right, the angle between the normal and the resultant acting on the plane AB. So this is my system of stresses now. And the soil is supposed to resist that shear stresses developed due to the shear resistance of the soil. Okay, so that it prevents it from deforming. So here excess is my uh, major principal plane on sigma on which sigma one acts. Then I have my minor principal plane YY where sigma three acts. Then I have a plane AB inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane XX and let sigma be the normal stress and tau be the shear stress. All right. So considering the equilibrium of wedge ABC, I am trying to prevent any movement of that wedge ABC. Okay. If this moves, I can say that my soil has failed. All right. So let us imagine that this system is in equilibrium. The wedge ABC within that soil element, let us imagine that it is in equilibrium. So if it is in equilibrium, you can easily resolve the forces acting on it, the stresses acting on it, right? So the horizontal and vertical uh, forces, it can be resolved to zero. So once you resolve to zero, you will get that your normal stress is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 into cos 2 theta. Similarly, you will get your shear stresses tau is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 into sine 2 theta. So this is the equation that represents the normal stress and shear stress on a plane which is inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane. Till here you might have seen in your solid mechanics course. Right. So now how, how can we use this for the uh, stress system in soil? We will see. Considering the equilibrium of the wedge I just showed you, the wedge ABC, if you consider the equilibrium of the wedge, you can easily resolve the uh, uh, forces in the horizontal and vertical direction and you can get the equations for normal stress and shear stresses as you can see here. So you can see the figure here, resolving these forces in the horizontal and vertical direction, you will get the expression for sigma and tau as this. All right. Very simple. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, resolution. So you can obtain these equations. So how can we use this for the Mohr circle? Let's see. So there's there's a there was a scientist Otto Mohr. He uh, devised a graphical method for determining this normal and shear stresses on any plane inclined at any angle theta to the major principal plane in 1882. So what you can do is you have you can plot your normal stresses along the x-axis and the shear stresses along the y-axis all right and the origin o i'll show you the figure all right so we can see on this figure using that stress system we have developed a, a more circle here so what uh, he had done is he plotted uh, the normal stresses on the x-axis all right o x he have plotted the normal stresses as you can see sigma 1 is OD which is my major principal stress sigma 1 is greater than sigma 3 that is why I call sigma 1 my major principal stress and sigma 3 my minor principal stress so sigma 1 you can see it is OD sigma 3 you can see it is OP all right now this O is called the origin all right you can see here OD is my sigma 1 OP is my sigma 3 so if you plot a circle with the radius uh, at the uh, if you plot a circle with radius sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 which is this pf or fd 
then you will you can plot a circle with radius sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 that circle is called the mohs circle all right so you have just drawn a graph x axis y axis then you marked the origin o then you marked your sigma 1 od then you marked your sigma 3 op then what did you do you found out the radius of this circle pd is the sides of the circle you calculated the radius which falls at the center of p and d which is f that you will get it as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 isn't it so with that as center and sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 as the radius you can draw a circle like this so this circle represents the mohr circle for that stress system all right all right now from the point p okay you are drawing a line ambiguous to the line ab which is ambiguous to the plane ab at an angle theta can you see the angle theta at point p qpf can you see that angle theta so qpf is a plane which is inclined at an angle theta to the xx plane or the major principal plane here all right major principal plane here is ox okay on which the normal stresses i have marked sigma 1 and sigma 3 a plane inclined at an angle theta that is pq i have drawn that line passes through p and through q and it makes an angle theta to the major principal plane represented by ox you can see theta so that will intersect this circle that we just constructed at a point q and that particular point q will have its coordinates as sigma and tau okay this is the major characteristic or property of a mohr circle that you can use okay from any point of this mohr circle if you draw any line pass through the point p or the pole p is called the pole from for from any point on this mohr circle if you draw any plane passing through that point p that particular point on the mohr circle will represent a stress system on that soil element on that particular plane which makes that particular angle with the point p suppose here in this case i have subtended a, a line pq which is representative of the plane ab which was inclined at an angle theta okay so on the plane ab there was a stress system so normal stress sigma and uh, shear stress tau so that this particular line pq the point q represents it intersects on this mohr circle and it represents the stresses on the plane ab which was inclined at an angle theta now imagine another uh, plane in that soil element suppose it was theta 1 so from the point p i will draw an angle theta 1 with ox that is a plane representing a, a plane inclined at an angle theta 1 that line will join some other point on this mohr circle and that coordinates on this mohr circle represents the normal and shear stresses on that particular plane right similarly for any plane inclined at any angle to the major principal stresses you can plot at the point p or the pole and that line will join or intersect the mohr circle at a point the coordinates of which will represent the normal stress and shear stress on that particular plane which is inclined at angle theta 1 or theta 2 or any angle all right or you can do it the other way also suppose i have another point on this mohr circle let me say pq r uh, point r on this mohr circle uh, some somewhere anywhere on this mohr circle i have a point r okay i have a point r on this mohr circle i have a normal stress and tau on that and if i join the point r and p i will get the angle rpx isn't it that is how much that uh, particular plane is inclined to the major principal plane so i can say that if for a uh, stress system 
with at, at that point R for that stress system sigma and T. This stress system is uh, developed inside the soil element and that plane, that particular plane on which the coordinates are sigma and tau, that particular point R, that particular plane is inclined at an angle theta one. I can say like that, right? So you can do it both ways. You can either uh, plot the angle theta and find out the stresses on that, or you can plot any point uh, Q or R, and you subtend it to the point P and the angle that it makes, it represents the angle with which the plane you are considering is inclined to the major principal plane. All right. So let us stick to this particular image now here. I can plot this particular point Q because I know this angle theta. OK, I showed you the figure uh, of the wedge earlier, wedge ABC. That angle BAC was theta, which was the angle uh, of the failure plane or the angle of the plane uh, under consideration within that soil element. All right. So this Q, P, X or the uh, wedge, you can say that Q, P, E represents that wedge ABC. Maybe you can say like that, right? So the Q here has the coordinates sigma and tau, and you can see that it makes the same angle BAC theta here at the pole P. Okay. So if you try to represent any plane within the soil element and subtend the same angle of that particular plane under consideration from the pole of the Mohr circle, that line is going to intersect the Mohr circle and that particular intersecting point, the coordinates of that intersecting point will give you the normal stress and shear stress acting on that particular plane. So I'll, I'll uh, try to explain it once again. So this wedge ABC I considered from within the soil element. OK, in that on that soil element, I had uh, normal stresses sigma one acting on the major principal plane XX and I have the minor principal stress sigma three acting on the minor principal plane YY. All right, this is my stress system of that particular wedge. All right, so I am considering a plane AB within that soil element, which was inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane. All right, so on this particular plane AB, which is inclined at an angle theta, you have normal stress sigma and shear stress tau acting. Okay. So this OX, O is called the origin of the Mohr circle. And this is Y axis, this is X axis. You draw the X axis and Y axis. Now the OX represents your major principal plane here, okay, in this particular problem. Okay, OX represents your major principal plane. Now on OX, I am going to plot my major and minor principal stresses, okay. So sigma 1 had some particular value. Let's say if sigma 1 is 100, sigma 3 is 50. So on some particular scale, on your uh, OX, axis you plot that sigma 1 and you plot that sigma 3 you have 100 and you have 50 correct so you have od now you have op right sigma 1 and sigma 3 you have marked now with a circle you should draw a circle connecting these point p and d so for that the radius of the circle should be pf or fd correct which will be equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2, correct? Which is 100 minus 50, that is 50 by 2, correct? Sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. Suppose sigma uh, 1 is 100, sigma 3 is 50. So 100 minus 50, 50 by 2, 25. Okay, so that 25 plus this OP, correct? 50 plus this 25, OP plus 25, that is the center of this. Right, you will get PF, correct? So you will get the point F. So the point F is sigma 3 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. You will get this sender between P and D, correct? So with that as sender and the radius of the circle is how much? Sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. 25 is the radius, isn't it? Radius of the circle is PF or FD whose value is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2, correct? 100 minus 50 by 2 is the radius of the circuit. 
so with that radius what you will do you will draw a circle so that circle will pass through points p and d this is your more circle for the current problem now i have created a more circle okay now there is a point p on this particular plane or x the point p i call this point p the pole p o l e pole okay so this point p or the pole has a particular property okay which is so earlier do you remember that wedge abc so that plane ab was inclined at an angle theta to the major principal plane right so if i try to recreate that particular plane here what will i do i will have to subtend that angle theta from the major principal plane at the point p okay so that i will get a line pq correct so what i am trying to do here is i am trying to find out the normal and shear stresses on a particular plane which is inclined at an angle theta so the major principal plane all right so that angle here is theta i subtend that angle from the point p which is the pole of the more circle i try to subtend that angle so i will get that line qp and the angle subtended now is qpx correct which is theta which is similar to the angle at which the plane ab was inclined to the major principal plane xx all right similar to the wedge so that if i draw such a plane with the pole p at the origin point inclined at an angle theta it will intersect the more circle at a point q look at the figure and point q where the coordinates will give you the stresses acting on that plane inclined at an angle theta the plane inclined at an angle theta was ab in that soil wedge and the stresses acting on it was sigma and tau so you can see that if i draw a similar inclined plane here pq the coordinates of the point q will give you the same stress system as that of the plane ab this is the concept of drawing the more circle now imagine some other plane suppose i had another plane cd with an angle theta 1 okay similar to that wedge abc suppose i had another plane uh, cd okay inclined at an angle theta 1 so from the point p if i draw another line with a angle theta 1 to the major principal plane ox it will intersect it at another point maybe pqr maybe it it will uh, intersect at another point r okay the coordinates of that point r will represent the stresses acting on that plane which is inclined at an angle theta 1 to the major principal plane now imagine any point on this more circle okay imagine any point on this more circle now any point on this more circle suppose i have the coordinate sigma 1 tau 1 okay any point on this more circle sigma 1 tau 1 i know that on some particular plane in the soil some particular a plane in the soil mass or in the soil element i have a stress system sigma 1 tau 1 okay on some random plane i have a stress sigma 1 tau 1 that is any some random coordinate on this more circle if i join that particular coordinate or particular that particular point on the more circle to the pole to the point p you will get another line right and that line is going to be inclined with the major principle plane or this axis ox here that angle will be the angle at which a particular plane on which that sigma 1 and tau 1 acts in that soil element okay you can use it both ways either you can find out the coordinates and find out the stresses acting on any plane act uh, any plane inclined at uh, an angle theta or you can have a stress system and you can trace it back to point p and find out at what angle that particular plane on which sigma 1 and tau 1 is acting so you can use it either way okay so now to find out the coordinates uh, sigma and tau q to find out the coordinates q using this graphical method what otomore did was you can see that sigma is equal to oe 
correct sigma is equal to oe can you see that oe e is equal to of plus fe correct so that is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus fe is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 into cos 2 theta which is the same as the equation that you derived earlier by resolving the forces on that wedge isn't it so from this graphical method you can see that both those equations are same for the sigma and tau is nothing but qe you can see that based on this 2 theta angle qfe you can see that considering angle triangle qfe you can see that that angle is 2 theta it is not 20 it is 2 theta okay so solving that the finding out the distance qe you can see that it is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 into sine 2 theta so you can see that both these equations are the same for the sigma and tau that we resolved earlier using the wedges.